So I feel like script-wise, this episode was definitely an improvement on last week's script. Uh, for, for one, it just felt more fun. Uh, I, I've mentioned this in, in other reviews where during this tournament of power, there's been specific scenes, specific moments that I think echo certain scenes from DBZ. And by the end of this episode, I definitely felt that way when I just I just got reminded of that Saiyan saga tension. They're on the ground. Each of them has their own individual crater, kind of like a little nest. And they're like, oh, I can't do anything. Crap. Oh, how dare you do that? If I could just move, oh, you'd be sorry. And so that forces some of the other characters to step in. I mean, the ones that can move to step in and try and do something about the situation. And, you know, some of them end up sacrificing themselves to protect their comrades. So it's kind of like the same feel. And the fight is technically a three-on-one, but it's a three-on-one with Seventeen having a pretty firm grasp on what his role needs to be in the fight, which is that of support. He's there specifically for support. He's trying to get Goku and Vegeta the opportunity to stay in the game for as long as possible. You see this very early on where he pushes Vegeta out of the way of, of one of Jiren's blasts. Visually, I felt like it was a very well choreographed three-way assault, for, for lack of a better term. Uh, it's just that Jiren is just so strong that it doesn't even matter. Like He just literally takes these three beams coming at him, and it's like nothing. There's one part where Seventeen does deal some damage, but that's pretty much damage that he deals at his own expense because he can't outrun his own explosion. He has to stay within that range, so he takes damage too, but it actually hurts Jiren. And then Goku's like, well, maybe that's the way to go. we got to catch him off guard and hit him hard. Like, just hit him with something really strong, catch him off guard. Seems like that's the only way, at least at this point. Because aside from that self-damaging attack that Seventeen pulled, Jiren just seems to be eating everything up. Like, all these attacks just eats them all up. Now, there's two scenes, two action sequences in this fight, in this episode, that really stood out to me. The first one was... He's charging up. I think Jiren is charging to land a hit on Goku. Goku uses instant transmission to dodge. He teleports above Jiren's head, and he's coming in with a Kamehameha, and then Jiren just gets a boost. He powers up, and he splits that Kamehameha beam just right in half. It looks so cool. It makes Jiren just look like a boss. He's just like, get out of here. Get out of here with that signature move of yours, Goku splits it, just erases it. And then the second scene that I thought was great and hilarious in this episode was essentially Jiren just two shots Frieza. It's it's a two shot, he two shots, well actually he one shots Golden, but I think it's a two shot because he sends Frieza flying to some rocks, he powers up, he gets angry, he doesn't care about the rules, he, he's going in with the intent of complete, like killing Jiren, he gets, he gets one shot. What's hilarious though is that this is the third time <laughs> This is the third time that Frieza gets this treatment. He gets put back in square one to the point where he, he doesn't move from where he started. He just, every episode, he ends it under some rubble or on the ground unconscious. And then he gets back up. <laughs> <laughs> and he keeps coming back, but he just, he can't move from that square. Poor Frieza, man. I, I hope, I hope this pays off soon. That being said, and putting the action side of the episode a little bit aside for a moment here, uh, this episode does kind of leave me with some questions. The first one being, like, how did Vegeta get so durable? I mean, his stamina, his endurance is tremendous. I mean, I have some idea as to why. I mean, he's been training, and, you know, he went into the chamber, and, you know, he's progressively gotten stronger through the arcs, but, man, like, he he survived his final explosion last week, and in this episode, he continuously is spamming this, this new form that he has, his strongest form, continues to spam it against Jiren, and it's crazy, especially if you take into consideration Beerus's observation during the last episode where he said that, technically speaking, Vegeta should be out of energy at this point. So, man, those those reserves, those energy reserves went up. And I mean up. Now, to be fair, I guess you could say the same thing technically about Goku, because he's been spamming Super Saiyan Blue plus Kaioken, even after using Ultra Instinct twice. But I think the difference is that we, we know that this is how Goku is. We know that that's part of his character. Like, Goku has been well-established as this uh, stamina behemoth that breaks his limits each time. And, you know, we, we've seen certain uh, aspects of Vegeta's character do the same thing, but I think it just it's a little bit more new for him. So it just takes more time to get used to it. But then in the preview, he's literally going fist to cuffs with Jiren in base. Base form Vegeta. Like, just, just you know, trying to land punches like, like a boxing match against Jiren. 
And then the following episode is called Noble Pride Till the End. Vegeta Falls. Wow. Spoiler alert, I guess. And then the next question that I have is primarily about Jiren's backstory. Because, let, let me see if I got this straight. Because this is what I took away from that little mini flashback exposition scene that we got. I understood it as this. Jiren is essentially... He has Batman's backstory and Superman's body. Like, if you combined Superman's body or a version of Soup's body with Batman's backstory in anime form, you would get Jiren, essentially. On the plus side, though, it's definitely worth mentioning that as a young alien child, Jiren was adorable. Look at that happy, happy child. We finally get the Jiren backstory that we've always wanted. And I don't know if it's because we know when Super is going to end. We, we know that we don't have a lot of episodes left, but it could be the timing, or it could be the situation, or it could be both. But I have to be honest, part of me did feel like I think it's a little bit late in the game to just barely be getting some, some insight, some backstory into Jiren, especially considering how big of a role we knew from the start that he was going to have. And don't get me wrong, because I definitely do appreciate the show at least giving us this, you know, so I'm thankful for that. But if this is all we get and super ends, I think once you rewatch the tournament, if, if you're planning on doing so, I think it's definitely going to feel like this was just rushed and it was just slapped on there. Just give, give Jiren some backstory. Pick something, you know, throw a dart at the board, see where it lands. Oh, it landed on Batman's backstory. So just give that to Jiren, tie it up in a neat little bow, and hand it over to the audience. So I hope we get more information on that soon. In fact, I actually think we have to because Jiren's wish wasn't revealed. It's like, what is he going to wish for if he wins, you know? 17, before he went out, I think 17, there was a moment where the show kind of makes it clear that 17 knew what Jiren would wish for, but that's not revealed. So we'll definitely get that bit of information later. Uh, however, I will say that, like, for example, during the flashback, my question is this. What happened to the evildoer guy that, that ended up killing Jiren's parents and his teacher and the rest of his friends. Like, what happened to that thing? Is that evil thing still a threat in Universe 11? Is it still at large? And if so, uh, is Jiren's wish the power to be able to vanquish that evil thing? Did Jiren defeat that thing already? And also, if the thing came back to attack Jiren, why did it kill his teacher and his friends and leave Jiren alive? Because if the evil was supposedly so strong that it wrecked everybody else, how did young Jiren escape? Because again, unless they're actually thinking of reusing that evil character for something else later down the road, or, you know, it being part of like, I don't know, like a storyline uh, regarding another universe and bringing it back into the story, just with this alone, it just feels kind of lazy. So my hope is that if the anime doesn't flush this out a little bit better, maybe maybe the manga will. Anyway, 17 sacrifice by the end, which is really what, what the finale of this episode is all about, was great. I, I loved it. Both from a visual standpoint, it was great. I mean, you kind of felt that thud by the end with the explosion and the brightness and stuff. And 18 yelling out, which, you know, we, we kind of can make the assumption with a lot of certainty that, you know, they'll revive 17, you know. They, they can get him back. It's not a big deal. But as a, as a character development moment for him, I think this was great because he says, well, I'm giving up on the cruise, you know, on the cruiser. So, uh, you know, you better thank me. He just puts these two barriers over Vegeta and Goku. I did see him put one over Frieza, but I'm assuming Frieza survived because they're not going to off screen that. But he says, wow, like, you know, I'm actually sacrificing myself for other people. How... How human of me to do that. And we had that moment with 18, you know, because, you know, she ended up marrying Krillin and stuff, but we never really got to see that side of 17 up until this point. So just having that there, I think, was just, it was great. And it definitely made the episode, just that alone made the episode worthwhile for me. It was a really good moment. And not only that, but there's a moment before the episode ends where Jiren and 17 kind of like, kind of like acknowledge each other a little bit. Like 17 tells them like, gee, all this time I thought I thought you were a monster. Like we didn't know anything about you up until this point. We just thought like you were like Mr. Stoic in the corner, just not talking or whatever. But now I see that, and this has to do with what 17 understands is Jiren's wish. We don't know what that is, but he says, he makes the assumption, oh, you're not really a monster. You're actually kind of human. And it could be that, you know, Jiren's wish, you know, he wants to revive his family and all the people that he lost 
uh, thanks to that evil, mysterious aura thing. And then Jiren tells Goku and Vegeta after Seventeen is gone, you know, you guys should be thanking that guy for sacrificing himself to shield you from your own weakness. And ultimately, it just came down to Seventeen understanding that in order to match Jiren's beam, Jiren's blast, he needed to explode. He needed to detonate himself because otherwise it would not have been enough. The barriers that he put up around Goku and Vegeta as shields would have just busted open if, if that blast had hit them. So, and before that, you even see him like put up a row of these shields, these barriers, and Jiren just casually just flies right through them. So he knew that he needed to explode to protect the world from devastation. Seriously though, major props to Seventeen. Just, just really great performance overall. One of the MVPs of this arc, of this tournament, for sure. And that's gonna do it for me, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Like the video if you did, appreciate it. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, because I do Dragon Ball Super reviews every Saturday night uh, from here until the end. Thank you. Comment down below with your thoughts. Catch you later. Bye.